Well, we're going to begin with hymn number 135, please. Hymn number 135, the veil is rent, lo, Jesus stands before the throne of grace, and clouds of incense from his hands fill all that glorious place. And we'll know the tune, and I trust that you'll look over the words as we sing it, beautiful words, talking about the access we have through Christ in the place of prayer tonight. But 135 will stand together after the introduction. Let's stand together. Let's still our hearts in the Master's presence together, please. Let's all bow in the attitude of prayer. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and praise Thee for the access that we possess before Thy throne tonight. And we come in and through the name of our Mediator, our Intercessor, the Lord Jesus Christ, Thine own dear Son. We thank Thee that we come not just into the courts of heaven, but we have full and free access through that veil that once separated us, that veil that has been rent in twain from the top even unto the bottom through the work of Calvary. And we thank Thee that as we stand in the holy of holies of God, we stand arrayed in another's righteousness. We stand upon the grounds of the shed blood And we come because Christ is our mediator. Christ ever liveth to make intercession for us. We come because we have that invitation to come boldly before the throne of grace. And it is here at the throne of grace that we obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How we thank Thee for this privilege that we possess, this privilege of the place of prayer. And, O God, we do pray that Thou forgive us for the fact that so often we have neglected the place of prayer. We have neglected the petitioning of the heavenly throne. We have neglected coming before Thee 
when we know we have full and free offer to come and to come boldly and we know that the ear of God every single time will be inclined unto our cry and our petition and yet so often we have refused to come and we have not prayed. And O oh God, we ask that thou forgive us for our sin. And we pray that thou help us from tonight onwards to be a people that pray without ceasing. A people that pray and know how to pray and continue to pray and, and never leave the place of prayer. But even in everything that we do, whether we be in the factory floor or whether we be in the farmyard or whether we be at home among family, that still we are those that are continually communing with our God and fellowshipping with Thee in the place of prayer. O oh God, we come before Thee just thanking Thee and praising Thee, knowing that praying time is never wasted time. And O oh God, we come thanking Thee all the more for the one who has given us that right of access. We rejoice in Jesus Christ. We thank Thee for the second person of the Trinity. We say with Solomon, yea, He is altogether lovely. And we thank Thee for each one in this meeting tonight that can go further than that. Yes, acknowledging that He is altogether lovely, but then saying, this is my beloved, and this is my friend. And we thank Thee for our salvation tonight. And in Christ, as we are accepted in the beloved, we can say, like Abraham of old, that we are the friend of God. How we thank Thee for all of Thy goodness toward us. And, O oh God, as we approach Thy throne now with due reverence, we pray for Thy help. We pray for Thy help that our worship may be done in spirit and in truth, that our worship may be a right in thy sight. O oh God, we ask that thou help us as we sing thy praises. Help us to sing with a full heart unto thee. O oh Lord, we pray that thou give us help as we read the Scriptures together. Lord, we pray that we may pour over every verse, every line, every word, knowing that it is the inspired Word of God. Father, we ask that thou bless the preaching of thy Word. Touch our hearts. We pray that we may not just be those that come in for an hour and a half and leave and just go through the motions and the ritual and a, a Protestant form of popery. Lord, that's not what we're here for. We, we long to meet with our God tonight. And we pray that we would not just have our ears open to the Word, but our hearts open to the Word also, that we would be doers of the Word. And, O oh God, we pray that Thou bless us Later on, as corporately uh, together, one after another, we pray. We ask that this would be a blessed season to our souls, that this time in the house of God in Bethel would be as the gate of heaven to us, that it would be the closest thing in that sense to heaven on earth as we stand before thy throne and worship the true and living God, Jehovah. But, O oh God, we pray for thy help. We pray for thy blessing. And we pray that thou minister unto our need tonight. Forgive us our many sins. Purify us now. Prepare us for true worship. We ask these things in and through the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his eternal glory alone. Amen. Do we have any favorites? Anyone like to shout one out and lead us off? 605. 605. And we'll do the first and last verses, and we'll keep our seats as we sing 605 to that blessed land up yonder where the angels ever sing hallelujahs to the Savior, sweet hosannas to the King. First and last, 605.
wasn't just sure on the tune for that one, but really fits in with what we're going to look at tonight. That chorus says, golden crowns of life to wear. And that's going to be one of our subjects tonight. And it's very fitting. Do we have another? 609, just over the page there. 609, love divine so great and wondrous, deep and mighty, pure, sublime, coming from the heart of Jesus, just the same through tests of time. First and last, 609. favorite 611 611 same page there my heart can sing when i pause to remember a heartache here is but a stepping stone first and last 611 12 there and we'll stand together as we sing there's coming a day when no heartaches shall come no more clouds in the sky no more tears to dim the eye we'll stand after the introduction 612 let's stand together Oh, yeah. 
day, glorious day, that will be. Now, we're turning in the Word of God together, please, to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, we're continuing on with our series in this wonderful book, the book of James, and we're looking at our seventh message thus far in this series, and we're looking at the title, The Reward for Endurance, The Reward for Endurance. And we'll read the first 12 verses again together, please, of James chapter 1, beginning at the verse 1. And in a moment, we're going to be taking the verse 12 as our text. James chapter 1, beginning at the verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall, into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that Love him. The reward for endurance. Now, it's very interesting. I believe the verse 12 and the verse 2 of James chapter 1 are precious, precious truths that we need to keep in constant remembrance before us every single day. And maybe you say, why? Why do we need to keep verses like the verse 12? Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Or verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. Why are verses like that verses that we need to keep before us every single day? I'll tell you why. Very simply, because trials come. Because trials, afflictions, temptations come, and they come every single day. They come continuously. Now, you may have trials and hurdles in your life that you would fall at, but maybe I wouldn't. At the same time, I will have uh, uh, pitfalls and hurdles and temptations that I may fall at, and, and yet you wouldn't. But the point is this. Every single one of us have various temptations come our way every single day. And every single day there is the possibility of letting the Lord down in those trials and in those temptations. Therefore, let us learn, blessed is the man, the woman, the individual that endureth temptation. There is a reward for endurance. Now think of it like this. Some of the heavy trials you possess, some of the, the, the difficult, hard trials you possess. Listen, if the devil was willing to tempt the Lord there is no doubt about it that he is going to try and tempt you as well. If the devil, you think who the devil is for a moment. The devil was Lucifer. He was one of those, those eminent angels in the glory, orchestrating all of the music of heaven. He had possibly one of the most intimate knowledges of who the Lord actually was. And he would have known that the Lord was the sinless, spotless Son of the Father and impeccable. And knowing all that, He still 
endeavor to tempt the Lord. Do you not think he's going to try and tempt us as well? So blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Come with me over a few pages to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, because Satan is a very real enemy. Satan is not just an enemy that is a, a, a fictitious enemy that the church has made up to try and keep believers in line. He is a real enemy. And tonight we're going to be looking at a lot of verses, a lot of portions, and I want you to have your Bibles at the ready, your King James Version of the Bible at the ready, and turn to these things. And 1 Peter 5 and verses 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be sober. Now you know what being sober is, don't you? I don't know if you've ever seen a drunk man. I've seen a drunk man before. I know in Liverpool there's many a time when you would see a drunk man staggering across the road or staggering through traffic and I've actually gotten out of a car and tried to help them out of danger and out of the road and, and it's a terrible sight to see someone so intoxicated that they don't know what they're at any longer. We know what the opposite is. Be sober. Have your wits about you. Be clear thinking. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Now, come with me over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and not only does Peter warn of the very real danger of the devil, but also Paul warns of the devil and his devices when he writes about the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 and the verse 11 as well. And this is a very real issue. And it says in Ephesians 6 and the verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Now listen, we have a church, a modern church, Christianity today that is largely blindfolded to the truth that we are in a warfare. You know, theologians used to call the church on earth the church militant. Militant. You know, we've become so weak and soppy and floppy that <laughs> there's no militancy about us anymore. We are called every single day to put on the armor of God. Why? Because the devil will come at us every single day. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against, against what? The wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. Therefore, I would submit to you, we need to be very, very careful on this issue and keep James chapter 1 and the verse 12 before us. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. We are called as the people of God to endure temptation and there is a reward for it. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. I want you to note five things with me tonight about James chapter 1 and the verse 12. I want you to note uh, simply the trying, the enduring, the receiving, the promising, and the loving. And all those words are in our text. So very simple to follow. So number one, the trying, the trying. Look what it says halfway down the verse initially. It says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. And look what it says, for when he is tried. Isn't it interesting that when James writes, he doesn't say, if he is tried. Doesn't say that, does he? He says, when, when. Just a matter of time that you and I will be tried. Maybe you haven't faced a, a severe trial, a severe affliction, a severe persecution, a severe attack from the devil. Well, friend, it's just a matter of time when. That's what our Bible says, for when he is tried. All of us, every single Christian, every single true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ will find a when moment, when he is tried. And temptations are real. Temptations are real. Now, it's interesting. James, when he initially starts to write, uses the word temptations largely in reference to persecution, persecution of the church. That's what he starts with in the verse 1. He's writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. The church that has had to flee persecution, flee for their lives. They've lost their businesses, their homes. They've ha had to scatter from their families. They've, they're literally on the run scattered abroad because of persecution. And then verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers 
temptations. And yes, when we come to the verse 12, we can read it as persecution to the church, to the Christian, but also in the wider sense of every form of temptation, whether that's persecution or affliction or whatever it is. Ultimately, temptations and trials are real. And temptations arise from different places. Now, we've already noted temptations from Satan, but I want to go into that a little more. You know, something I want to just encourage you with, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. A lot of Christians have this false notion that the devil is all-powerful. The devil is not all-powerful. So many Christians have this notion that the devil is omnipresent, that he's in all places at all times. He's not omnipresent. He is just a created being. He is a fallen angel. That's what he is. Now, now he's a very dangerous creature, a very dangerous individual, the wicked one, the tempter, the accuser of the brethren. But listen, don't overestimate his powers either. You know, as believers, as the children of the living God, he is not one that we fear. We are aware of him. We are aware of his devices. But at the same time, we believe and know that the Lord is far more powerful than he and come with me to James chapter 4 and the verse 7. There is such a thing as temptations from the devil, directly tempted by Satan, directly tempted from Satan's cohorts, other fallen angels as well. But look at the advice, the, advice, the warning of James 4 and the verse 7. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Why do we submit ourselves to God? Because he is all-powerful, because he is omnipresent, because he is God. And if we're submitting ourselves to God, we will be able to, verse 7, resist the devil. And look what it says after that. And he will flee from you. He will flee from you. But there are temptations that arise from the devil. In fact, come with me to Luke 22. Not only do we find that James writes about it, and Peter writes about it, and Paul writes about it in Ephesians, but the Lord speaks about the temptation of Satan as well. In Luke chapter 22, and look at the verses 31 and 32, these are words from the Lord's mouth. And just remember this, that the Lord is far greater and far more powerful than the devil will ever be. That encourages us tonight as the people of God. But nonetheless, the devil's dangerous. And it says in Luke 22, in the verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now, you know when we're reading the verse 31, the Lord isn't just speaking to Simon. Now, yes, there's the, the repetition there. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath de desired to have. But you see that word you, just for interest, if you want to write it in your margin, the word you there is written in the plural. And we find that, yes, the Lord is speaking to Simon, but he's speaking to all the apostles as well. He's speaking to all his people that ultimately, yes, Satan wanted, wanted Peter, but he wanted all of them. He wanted to sift them all. What does it mean, sift them all as we knock them about, rattle them through, really bring them into such affliction and turmoil to ultimately endeavor to attempt to destroy them? That's what Satan longs to do. Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as we. Uh, but look at the verse 32 and underline this in your Bible. But I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you. That's where our strength lies. Even when Satan tempts, the Lord prays for us. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. And with that in mind, come with me to Revelation 20. Revelation 20 in the verse 10. I want to encourage the child of God tonight. Maybe the devil has been busy. Maybe the devil's cohorts have been busy attacking you and trying to sift you as we... You remember this. You can submit yourself to God and the devil will flee from you. You can ultimately know that Christ prays for you. But also there is coming a day and it is a day that Satan knows about himself. A day when he finally will be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. And hallelujah for that. It says in Revelation 20 in the verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Did you notice the tense in the verse? 
I want you to note this. Look at the verse again. What's it say? And well worth underlining and circling. And the devil that deceived them. See that little word? That's worth circling in your Bible. What's it say? It says was. Isn't it interesting how we read about a future event written in the past tense? Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because God is sovereign. And when God says something will be done, it will be done. And therefore, when God has said it will be done, the God who cannot lie and it is impossible for God to lie and the all-powerful God that is capable of doing it, when God has said that future event will take place, it is as good as done. And we read there, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And that's a future date that I'm looking forward to. But there's temptations from Satan. But then come back with me to James chapter 1, because we find when it says, for when he is tried, yes, there's maybe the more obvious temptations by Satan, but also there's such a thing as having temptations by our fellow man. Temptations by our fellow man. You know that? That's a very solemn thing, isn't it? And I'm not going to just talk about temptations from people out there, out in the world out in nature's darkness. At times, we can be tempted by our fellow man in the church of Jesus Christ. That's a solemn thought, isn't it? Come with me, if you would, to Romans 14. Romans 14. And look at the verse 13. And I want you to be careful now. I want you to be careful as the people of God in Monash Lane. And you review things, and you examine yourself, and you say, you, you look at it tonight, and you say, am I doing something in my life that is hindering somebody else's walk with God? Am I doing something that ultimately will be, will be tempting my fellow man in the church or in the world or in my neighborhood, wherever it is? Romans 14 and the verse 13 says, Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now, you can put a stumbling block in other people's way. Other people can put a stumbling block in your way. There are such a thing as temptations by our fellow man. But isn't it solemn how we read in the verse 13, in his brother's way. The idea of being part of the same family, the same spiritual family, how there are Christians out there putting stumbling blocks in one another's way. Come with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and the verse 9, and it's interesting how the Apostle Paul labors it not only to the church at Rome, but also here to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 8 and the verse 9, and he nearly repeats the thing verbatim. And it's fascinating. He warns, be careful, be careful that we are not hindering somebody else in the faith. 1 Corinthians 8 and the verse 9 says, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Now, isn't it interesting in the verse 9 how we read of Christian liberty? Take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. I want to say something else. You can put a stumbling block in another brother or sister's way, and maybe you're not actually doing something sinful. You actually have full Christian liberty to do it. And you can argue from the Word of God and say, whatever I'm doing, it is allowed, it is permissible, I have permission. And yet, somebody else who is weaker in the faith, they see you and they go into the same thing or something like unto it and it's wrong and and you ultimately are putting a stumbling block in somebody else's way. Let me put it this way. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. Let me tell you a story. I don't know if it's a true story or not, but someone was telling it to me this afternoon about a farm inspector from the agricultural department that came into some old boy's farmyard, and and he said, I have a piece of paper here. I have a piece of paper, and I have the legal right to go through and check every barn, every wee hut, every, every enclave of this farm. I have the right to walk every single field to check that you are following all of the laws of the agricultural department. The farmer said, well, if you have the piece of paper, then I suppose that's all right, but you're not allowed in the backfield. <laughs> and the man said, but, but I have the piece of paper. I have the legal right. 
I'll go wherever I want. He said, well, you can go wherever you want, but you're not allowed in the backfield. And that man, being stubborn and thinking he had the legal right to do whatever he pleased, he decided, I'm going to start in the backfield because I'm not allowed in the backfield. So the farmer stood in the yard and waited for a little while, and he heard, before he knew it, a few shouts and a few screams, and walked over to the gate and leaned over the gate, and he saw the inspector running across the field and this angry bull chasing him through the field. And the inspector said, the bull, there's a bull, it's chasing me. And the farmer shouted back, show him your piece of paper. Show him your piece of paper. Just because you have the right to do something doesn't mean you should do it. And what we read here in 1 Corinthians is having, yes, Christian liberty to maybe do something, but don't do it if it's going to be a stumbling block to somebody else in the faith. We can put temptations in the road, temptations in the road of other believers of our fellow man. But then there's temptations by just simple afflictions of life. Maybe you say, well, there's a temptation there that I'm born in poverty and I don't have two pennies to rub together. That still doesn't mean you love money for the love of money is the root of all evil. There's various temptations of life. There's the temptations of Satan, temptations of our fellow man, temptations of life itself. But something that maybe is a touch little uncomfortable tonight, there's temptations by ourselves. We tempt ourselves. We tempt ourselves. Come with me to Mark 14. Mark 14 and the verse 38. And something I must warn you of, that oftentimes we are guilty of tempting ourselves. And you know, at times we like to, something goes wrong or a temptation comes and we fall at that hurdle and we like to pin it on the devil, don't we? Now, the devil is often responsible, but oftentimes we're responsible. We're responsible for leading ourselves into temptation. And Mark 14 and the verse 38, look what the word of God says. It says, watch ye and pray, lest, what does it say? Ye enter into temptation. It's not talking about temptation coming to you now. It's talking about watch ye and pray, lest what? Lest ye go, ye go and enter into temptation. You go and find temptation for yourself. Often we do that, don't we? We tempt ourselves, we lure ourselves in. And I encourage you, if that's you, then put safeguards in place. Put safeguards in place. If you're the type of person that is going to whittle away your time and waste time watching television every hour of the day, you know what to do? Get rid of it, throw it in the bin. If it's the same with the internet, same with anything else. If there's something in your life that is going to hinder your walk with God, get rid of it, friend. Don't enter into that temptation. Don't enter into that temptation. Come with me to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. We see it again. In fact, we see it time and time again. But we only have time to look at a couple of these things. But uh, Ephesians 4, look at the verses 26 and 27. Ephesians 4, verse 26. It says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, it's interesting, just want to say this in the verse 26, there is such a thing as righteous anger. There is such a thing as righteous anger, yet I would submit to you that the majority of our, our, our anger is not righteous. The majority of our anger is not righteous at all. And the best course of action for the believer is don't be angry at all. But nonetheless, we read, be ye angry and sin not and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And look what it says now, verse 27. Very interesting. Neither give place to the devil. And what's that? That's the same thing as entering into temptation. That's us actually opening the door and inviting the devil in and saying, Satan, you take a hold of that and you make it a temptation in my life. Friend, the Word of God says, you shut the door on him. Don't give place to the devil. Don't let him into that. Because if he gets his foot in the door, he will wreak havoc and destruction. And oftentimes it is us that let him in. Neither give place to the devil. And we also read something similar in verses 22 through to 24, that it is ourselves that cause the temptation. Look what it says in verse 22 of this same chapter. It says that ye put off concerning the former conversation or the former behavior the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 
that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see, every single day you will face the devil's temptations, you'll face temptations of your fellow man, you'll face temptations just by various afflictions in life, but every single day the old man within you will well up within you and create temptation for yourself. What do I do, preacher? You crucify the old man daily. You bury the old man daily. You say, no, I am a follower of Jesus Christ daily. And you put on the new man, the Christ-like man, the holy man daily. That is our task. That's easier said than done. Yet nonetheless, as we come back to James 1 and the verse 12, temptation is real. And when it says in the verse 12, when he is tried, be sure of this, friend, you will be tried. You will be tried. But then not only do we see the trying, but we see, secondly, the enduring. The enduring. And look what it says here concerning the enduring verse. 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. You know the word endureth? The word endureth there can be translated to stay, to persevere, to have fortitude, to remain, to do those things which are difficult, to not go the way of the temptation, but rather to stay steadfast and have fortitude in the things that are right. Now, you may have heard this before, but I, I firmly believe it. I am a firm believer that God will never allow a temptation, a trial, an affliction to come into your life that you cannot bear. I'll repeat that. I am a firm believer that God will never Never allow a temptation, a trial, an affliction to come into your life that you cannot bear and you cannot endure. And you say, preacher, that sounds well and good. But where's the proof for that? Where's the proof for such a statement? Well, come with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and the verse 13, we find very clear proof that in your life, you will never, and I'll repeat that, you will never, have a temptation that you're not able to endure if you choose to endure it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And 1 Corinthians 10 and the verse 13 says, and I would mark it in your Bible if you're in the habit of doing so, verse 13, for there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. Look what it says now. But God is faithful. Who will, suffer, uh, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Do you know what we're reading there? We're reading that in your Christian experience, in your Christian life, you will never face a temptation that the Lord knows you are not able to endure and you are not able to bear. Why? Because God is faithful. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Now, I firmly believe in a sovereign God. I believe that God is sovereign. And even though it may be difficult to comprehend, and even though it may be difficult to understand, that all of these things work out for our good and God's glory. Just listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and the verses 9 and 10. It says, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Romans chapter 8 and the verse 28, and you know this as well, when it says, and we know that all things work together for good. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And look again with me at this verse we've just glanced at. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians 10, and look at the verse 13 again with me, please. Because there's something here I want to stress. I want to underline here. There is always a way of escape. There's always a way to endure it. It says, but God is 
faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. Now underline that in your Bible. Also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now, we don't tempt ourselves unnecessarily. We don't tempt ourselves unnecessarily. We don't lead ourselves into temptation. We don't give place to the devil to tempt us either. We don't deliberately put hurdles and pits and falls and roadblocks in our path. We don't do that. That is just folly to do that. But when temptation comes, and the Lord knows at times temptation comes, then the Lord will always provide a means by which you can endure it, or by enduring it, you can escape it. You can escape it. You say, really? Is that the truth? Come with me to Genesis. Genesis 39 and the verse 12. And this is a pattern. This is a pattern. If you feel this is something I can't endure, I can't cope with it, I wouldn't know what to say, I know if I was in that scenario that I would fall, I would fail, I would get myself in trouble and sinfulness, then friend, the policy is simple. You run. You run, you flee, you escape, you get out of that scenario. We see that pattern with Joseph. Joseph in Genesis 39 and the verse 12. And the background is Joseph has been given great honor and privilege in Potiphar's house. We find Potiphar's wife, no doubt, is a young, attractive woman. Joseph is a handsome young man as well. I'm sure you can understand the whole temptation that is there. And Joseph lays the pattern for us in Genesis 39 and the verse 12. It says, and she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand, look at it now, and fled and got him out. Now, I don't fault Joseph here at all. Joseph knew if I was to stay in this scenario, that I would not endure this scenario. So what did he do? He ran. He ran straight for the door and he got out. What is that? That is the Lord, even in this temptation, providing a way of escape. Why? So that he would be able to bear it. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. There is more than one way of enduring. Maybe it's enduring in the moment. Maybe it's enduring temptation by just running from the situation. But there is always a way out of temptation. Remember that, Christian. Remember that. Now, our time's away, so I'm not going to rush through the rest of it because this is a precious verse. But look with me again at James 1 and the verse 12. It says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, look at it now, he shall, he shall, there's a promise now. And what's the promise? He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And I want you to note this, there is a reward for endurance. There is a reward for endurance Trials will come, whether it's from Satan, whether it's from your fellow man, whether it's just from general scenarios in life, whether it's yourself bringing temptation. Temptation will come when he is tried. But Christian, always remember, God will allow you the capability through his power and through the Holy Spirit to always be able to endure that temptation. And there's a blessing for that. And then there's a reward the crown of life, and we'll come to that the next time, the various crowns that the believer is promised. And this one is the crown of life, the crown of tribulation, the crown of martyrdom, the crown of suffering for the cause of Jesus Christ. But there's a crown of gold there for those that know how to endure temptation. And how do we know there's a crown? How can we be assured that there is a reward for those that endure? The end of the verse 12 says, which the Lord hath promised. Why? Why are we sure of it? Why is it a sure thing? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord has promised it. The Lord has promised it. If I promise you something, I know and you know I could fail on that promise. But the Lord, the Lord, he cannot lie, Numbers tells us. In Titus, we read he doesn't lie, and in Hebrews we read it is impossible for God to lie. So if the Lord has promised, it's a sure thing. It's a sure thing, and it's a sure thing to them 
that love him, to the child of God and to the child of God alone. And we'll explore those things at another time. But remember this, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. We trust the Lord to bless his word to each of our hearts for his own name's sake. Hymn number 560. Hymn number 560. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. And the chorus gives wonderful advice. Ask the Saviour to help you. Ask the Saviour to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you. You three, 560 will stand as we sing. Let's stand together. 